Hello, the passage for today's Easter reflection is Luke 23, verses 32 to 49. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saves others. Let him save himself if he's the God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine and vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I say to you, Today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he'd said this, he breathed his last The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So this is the sixth of a series of Easter reflections tracing Jesus' journey to the cross, his death and resurrection. In this passage, Luke picks up the story after Jesus has been dragged before both Pilate and Herod, after Peter has denied ever knowing him, after the crowd have shouted for the release of the murderer Barabbas uh, and demanded that Jesus be crucified. Jesus has already suffered scourging, the whipping of his back with something called a flagellum, leather thongs into which pieces of bone or metal were attached, designed to shred the flesh. He is then taken with two criminals to a place outside the city, a place called Golgotha, the skull, and all three are crucified. Crucifixion was an utterly miserable way to be put to death, and the Romans used it liberally. There were a variety of methods, but all involved nailing the victim to some kind of wooden structure, which could be a vertical stake, a T or the cross shape we're more familiar with. The crucified were almost invariably naked, public humiliation being a key part of the process. Nails were driven through hands or wrists and feet or heels, and the individual raised up into position. A particular attraction of this form of execution was that the death came slowly. It could take days and was utterly agonising. The victim fighting to get air into his lungs by pulling or pushing himself up on nailed hands or feet. The word excruciating, literally out of crucifying, comes from this. So drawn out was the process that death was often hastened by breaking the victim's legs, resulting in swifter suffocation. It was an act of deterrent. The victim often left suspended after death as a persistent warning to others. The crime for which they'd been executed written out on a notice above their heads. So horrendous was it as a form of execution that it was controversial even in ancient Rome. The orator Cicero describing it as a most cruel and disgusting punishment. This is what Luke is referring to when he writes that Jesus was crucified. And as Jesus hung there, Luke tells us that spectators and soldiers mocked him. Above his head had been placed a notice which read, King of the Jews, a description of his supposed crime that he had claimed kingship, but dripping with contempt. What then 
does this death mean? Why do Christians declare that the death of Jesus is absolutely central to their faith? What purpose does this cruel and shocking execution serve? The history of Christianity could perhaps be seen as an attempt to make sense of the cross and the implications of that for humanity. Different metaphors have been used, all of which reflect some aspect of the truth, but all of which, if relied on exclusively, run into difficulties. So let's take a step back and start with this. What is the problem to which the cross is the answer? The core problem, <coughs> Christians believe, is that the relationship between God and mankind has been ruptured by sin, like a poison which seeps into the root of the tree and takes every new leaf. This poison not only made us less than we were created to be, but it has warped the whole of creation. We and it were lost and without hope. Something had to be done, and the cross, born out of his love for us, was God's solution. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life, John 3.16. Quite how this sacrifice works to repair a broken creation is a deep mystery which truly we can only comprehend in part. The key is to grasp these biblical truths. Firstly, it was motivated by love. Secondly, it means that our sins can be forgiven. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace that he lavished on us, Ephesians 1.17. Thirdly, that forgiveness was costly, but that cost was borne by God himself. This is not the punishment of an innocent son by an angry father. It is God himself choosing to live, suffer and die as one of us, and by so doing, rescue us. Fourthly, it enables us once again to have a right relationship with God. Fifthly, it marked a crushing triumph over evil, a breaking of its power, allowing us to choose to live freely and to be fully human as God intended. To end, a few words from Christian writer Nigel Wright from his book, The Radical Evangelical. In the cross, God in Christ so partakes of and takes up into himself the sufferings of his fallen creation, that he is qualified to be the God of the outcast and the forsaken. Through the cross, God has qualified himself through his entry into human experience and his endurance of our fate to be the one who can come to our rescue and be, in the fullest sense of the word, our saviour. Thank you.